Hello, sir. Hello, it's that time again. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Smart Less. <laughs> Welcome to Taming the Hustle. Or something of the sorts. Uh, another day, another couple topics. And are you excited for today? Yeah. Yeah. I'm always excited. Nice. It's always nice to catch up with you. Are you having a good day so far today? Fabulous day. Fabulous. I uh, I want to talk about something. Life is good. This is, and speaking of life, I, I want to know that I'm not the only one out there. Maybe I am, but I feel like uh, I, I do something. My wife makes fun of me for it. But uh, when, when we go to a store, so like you and I went shopping recently where you're looking at jackets and I see a hat and I'm like, oh, it's a really nice hat. So I walk up and I, I look at the, the price tag and the hat was like $250. And I was like, holy shit, I'm not holy paying. Fuck. Yeah, there's no way I'm paying $250 for a hat. But I look over and the salesperson's looking at me. So I release the tag from my hands, but then I continue to look at the hat as if, oh yeah, I'm going to buy this. Who oh. spends that on a hat anyway? Oh, I know. And so, you know, I look, I'm like, oh, the clean lines. Oh, look at the piping around this hat. That's very nice. Yeah. You know what? Maybe it is something I'm going to buy. You're playing the old fake it till you make it. That's card. exactly what it is. I feel like, and it, I, I'm sure there's other people out there who do that. I love the sticker shock. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I would love to have the balls someday just to be like see that shock and then turn to the salesperson like $250. You guys fucking nuts. Yeah. Who the fuck pays that? <laughs> but no, I always, I fake it. And it, you know what? I think it's the marketing part of me that does it is because I know, like I tell my clients, figure out what you're worth, figure out your price and stick to it. So if they figured out their price and that's what it's worth, I don't want to offend them by, you know, being like, Whoa, that's fucked up. Instead, I fake it and I'm like, oh, that's what, what a reasonable price. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to think about this one. I'm going to moonwalk out of this store. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, well, by the time I leave, I'm like, I got my running shoes on. You think of the stupidest stuff to talk about. I know. I'm sorry. It's, uh, the, it's all good. You're keeping life interesting. I think that's what I was going to say. It's, it's all about interest. We should have called the podcast like stupid shit we talk about now. <laughs> Welcome to Taming the Hustle. Or something of the sorts. Hustle or the stupid shit we talk about. <laughs> there you go. So, what are we talking about today, Daryl? We are going to talk about. Uh, Let's get to the real podcast. Uh, I'm going to talk about brainstorming creative content like a marketing team does. There's so many businesses out there where they're just one person or two people, and th- there's no way I could brainstorm like a marketing team does when that's just not true. So, I want to talk about that. I love brainstorming with my team. It's so much fun. It's like, to me, that's like my hobby part of my business is yeah. the marketing piece. So For sure. And I think that's in, in large part why we're here today, actually. Nice. What uh, What do you want to talk about? I want to talk money and marriage. <sighs> Relationships. Money and marriage. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, not, yeah, I'm not pulling the psychology card here. I'm, I'm not an expert in, in the mind. Uh, but I will talk to you about money and, and what I'm good at and, yeah. what, and what I know. So money and marriage, we're not, my wife's not coming on as a surprise guest, is she? No, no, oh, she's not invited. Thank God. Not today. Phew. That could have been embarrassing. That's for another day <laughs> <a> and another topic. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know what? Do you want to, you want to fire up this, uh, this wagon and get her going? Yeah, for sure. Just from experience with clients we've been working with and the generation that we're in, I wanted to chat about some of the observations we've made with relationships and money. So like the days of mom and dad or grandma, grandpa working one career the whole life and sharing one bank account and have everything in common and just having like one set of books, for lack of better words, is pretty much gone, right? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing clients come in where couples don't know anything about their finances. And that could be a little bit scary. I, I sort of respect the position that they have because of the circumstances, but at some point in time, it's kind of nice to see things as a couple when it comes to finances. For sure. So talking about keeping things separate. So pretty much every client we work with now have their own bank accounts. It's very rare that you have one couple that has one joint account. Why? Because people want to have their privacy respected. Right. So if yeah. I want to buy Meg something nice, I yeah. don't want her to have access to my visa to yeah, be able yeah. 
you know, you're talking about surprises. Yeah. How do you keep some level of privacy if exactly. everything is joint? Or if you're buying weird shit for yourself. Or if I'm buying weird shit for myself. So there's really nothing wrong with that. But at some point in the planning process, as a couple, you sort of have to find common ground in terms of what your common objectives are financially. Yeah. Right. So if one's goal is to strictly have enough money to travel the world their entire retired life, or if they want to start traveling now and say, I'm going to work an extra five or 10 years to be able to travel now where the other spouse says, well, I want to focus on paying off the mortgage as quickly as possible. So even though you're keeping shit separately, yeah. how do we then have conversation to make sure that we're still working towards common goals? For sure. And that is a really important part of developing a trusting financial relationship with your spouse. I feel like you're talking about me. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, just I'm, I'm speaking to pretty much everybody now. <laughs> I'm glad to know we're not alone. Like my wife's the one who's like, let's pay off the mortgage as fast as humanly possible. Let's have this big bank of savings. And I'm the guy who just built a theater in his basement. Yeah, well, but, but at the same time, if you're sharing common objectives, that's fine. Mm -hmm. If your plan in life is to just retire as soon as possible and backpack Europe until you drop dead. Yeah. Whereas Aaron wants to be sitting at the cottage yeah. reading a book on the dock. How the fuck's your relationship going to work? So having common objectives, I think it's very important for you to have conversation about what some of your financial goals are to make sure that you're sharing some of those goals. Yeah, definitely. And that's sort of a segue into the planning process together. So we often have clients come in and say, well, I just want a financial plan for me and my wife could do whatever she wants. Yeah. Or the wife will come in and say, I want a financial plan designed for me and my husband can do whatever he wants. But that's us trying to chisel off just like one piece of the puzzle. Yeah, for sure. And if we're ignoring income taxes, for example, because mm -hmm. typically you would file your taxes together yeah. and at retirement, we can find some efficiencies, right? So if we have one spouse that has a business that qualifies for the lifetime capital gains exemption, they sell that business and they have nearly a million dollars of tax paid capital. They've maxed out their TFSA. So they have all of this tax-free income. And then the other spouse has this monster teacher's pension. You know, they retired as a high school principal and they've got, they've yeah. got this massive pension, which is all taxable. When we look at it as a couple, we can find some efficiencies, right? So designing two separate plans seems very, very inefficient and ineffective for us. Okay. So we try to coax our clients to say, okay, we understand that you want to keep things separate and that's totally cool, but a part of your finances have to be meshed. Yeah. And here's the reason why. Because they can help each other out. You're going to have probably a stronger relationship or you're going to figure out you don't belong together because if you have no common goals, what yeah. the fuck are you doing? Right? What exactly. are you in it for? Yeah. And then the other thing is creating those efficiencies is you know, should we be doing spousal RSPs instead of regular RSPs to get larger tax breaks? You know, should we be looking at pension splitting at retirement to increase, you know, your funding to make sure that we're addressing any shortfalls in your plan? Yeah. And then that takes me to the, the tax filing. So I get a very, very common question is, should we be filing together? Well, if you're living together, the law says you're, you have to file together. If you're filing together, you can then, like I mentioned, do pension splitting at mm -hmm. retirement, but you could also do some form of income splitting while you're in the workforce. So for example, if Aaron were to get laid off for whatever reason, yeah. okay, and she has a year where she's searching for employment, but has no income, you can actually use her personal exemption amount, which is called an eligible dependent deduction. Yeah. So the deduction in Canada is approximately 14,000. So the first 14 grand that you earn, you're not paying any tax on. Uh -huh. If Aaron has the misfortune of being out of work for a year, you yep. can actually claim her as a dependent and claim her 14,000. So now the first 28,000 you earn is tax free. Oh, man, if she was a dependent, I would ground her <laughs> for real. No, <laughs> yeah. no going out with your friends on Saturday night. You'd cut her off of sex, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be it. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, the second piece on that is also, you know, making it easy to provide evidence to the government if Aaron were to pass away, but you'd been filing separate your whole life. And then you go and apply for the Canada pension survivor benefit and like, oh, well, I see where this is going. How are you getting the survivor benefit if you're fucking single? Yeah. Right? yeah so yeah. then you have to provide evidence that 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 was not the case. It raises red flags is all it does. Yeah. yeah. It's like me at a bar. I. I can't wear wedding rings. I can't wear rings on my hands. And so when a cute girl comes up to me, 
I have to justify and say, hey, I'm married and try to make her believe that and that I'm not just shooting her down. Okay. Now, now I know that's a made up story. No, it's true. It's true. <laughs> so there you have it. That's it. Hey, eh? love and marriage. Yeah. Love and marriage. Oh, money and marriage. I, I didn't want to talk about the, the relationship piece because again, I'm not the expert, but when it comes to finances, just keep in mind that although you're keeping stuff separate, that you should be having conversation about common grounds and common objectives when it comes to your finances to make sure that what you're doing is compatible and that we're not leaving anything off the table in terms of tax efficiencies. Uh, the planning process together, again, it's very much tax planning Yeah, uh, and just implementing the right strategies as a couple. So even though you're keeping stuff separate, uh, we should be planning collectively as a couple. And then filing your tax returns should be done together. There's no real advantage of filing separately anyway. So it's not like you're oh, okay. screwing the government or that, yeah, yeah. you know, you're taking advantage of some tax savings. Yeah. Uh, unless you're like really low income, there's really not a whole lot of benefit. Gotcha. And, and typically the people we work with have money, right? So it's usually not an issue. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I wish our ad had the theme song for Married with Children right now, but because when you said money and marriage, now that's mm-hmm. stuck in my head. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. Love mm-hmm. and marriage. <laughs> going to be stuck in my head. Such a classic. I know. Hey, we're going to take a quick break, but uh, we'll see you on the other side. Did you know that the week of November 20th is Financial Planning Week? That's the week that reminds you to get your together. Holy crap, you just got beeped. They thought I was going to say but I actually said to get your portfolio together. Get your together. Hashtag call Renee, St. Cyr and Associates. Brainstorming. Brainstorming. I want a lot of small business owners think when I, when I first talk to them. I'm going to cut you off right sure. there. I think that that is our biggest strength as buddies is our ability to brainstorm. Oh, for sure. We throw shit to the wall all the time. Not all of it sticks, but the ones that do are spectacular. When we look back at the years that have gone by, we've come up with some really genius stuff. Exactly. Live well today while planning to live well tomorrow. All right. All right. All right. Hashtag call Renee. (laughs) Oh, there's so many. So many. So many. It's ridiculous. Um, Usually a result of a glass of wine and a company of good friends and uh, the creative juices flowing. So so exactly what you just said right there is kind of the points I'm going to touch on, really. Um, Because we get small business owners all the time that we consult with. I didn't mean to steal your thunder. No, no, it's all good. You, You led me right to the water. So we get a lot of small business owners who we consult with. And one of their things is when we, we sit down with them, we're like, yeah, you need to brainstorm some creative ideas for your marketing strategy. That's, that's probably your target market anyway, as, as a boutique marketing firm is the small business owner. Definitely. You know, in conversation that you and I have had is that your target market is very intentional because of the level of impact that you have in those businesses that be able to work directly with, you know, the owners, the people that are ground zero Mm -hmm. and have that creative genius and the brainstorming as opposed to just being cookie cutter with the larger organizations. Well, and that's the thing we've, we've worked at that over the years by working with, you know, a big bank and then seeing how they don't really give a shit. And we started working with small businesses in, in, at the same time. And we just shifted from those big companies to these smaller companies because we felt like we could give more to them, right? Uh, we get the more of an attachment, more we care. We actually give a shit about you succeeding, which is crazy. You're like Santa Claus. You get to give more. That's right, Santa. Ho, ho, ho. This isn't our Christmas episode, though, so it's really awkward right now. Yeah, awkward. So when when people say brainstorming, uh, you know, small business owners will say to me, it's like, well, I'm just one person, or it's me and my wife, or it's me and my buddy. And we say, but that's all you need. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? How are we supposed to brainstorm? Well, we don't have any ideas. And so I always tell people this, and I say, invite others in. Everyone holds their cards close to them. But at the same time, if you have team members, if you have employees, bring them in. I don't care if they are the custodian. Oh my God, like friends, family. Friends, fuck family, anybody. anything. Our clients. So I get yep. I get so many texts now. It's so fucking hilarious. I share most of them with you, but it's like I'll have a client that's like, I got a hashtag call Renee idea. Yeah. And then they'll text me an idea <laughs> or they'll call me and they're like, I have an idea for the next hashtag call Renee commercial. I'm like, this is so fucking awesome. I know that people are that engaged exactly. with our philosophy yep. and our and our presence on social media and our values and just want to take part in that. Yep. It's so magical. I'm stealing your thunder again. That's but, okay. That's but I okay. love this stuff. Like this is this is why you and I work together yep. because I absolutely love marketing 
on the brainstorming piece of things. So when we run out of ideas, like yep. I'll flee to my brother Andre's and his family because he's got two young kids and we start talking about this stuff and like they come up with the best ideas because they just see things a different way. It's and it's from it's an a, outside perspective. It's a fresh perspective. Yeah. It's an outside perspective. It's a different it's just, it's a different generation altogether. Yeah. There's also the innocence of children that come oh, up with the coolest stuff. So, and that's, and that leads me to this is that there are no bad ideas. There aren't. Elaborate on that though. So I will pitch something and I, I've done it all my life. I'll start pitching an idea and I, I, and I'll warn people. I'm like, this is a big piece of dog shit that I'm throwing on the wall here. Be prepared. And they throw it up and everyone's like, oh man, eesh, yeah. But then someone looks at it and says, huh. But what if? Yeah. What if we just tweaked it and we said this instead? And then all of a sudden that became a campaign and it was huge and it was successful. And when you look back and you're like, remember, I threw that big piece of dog shit on the wall and you ate it up. You and I have done that a quadrillion times. I'm sitting in fucking traffic and I'll call you and I'm Mm -hmm. like, dude, I know this won't be the idea, but I have an idea and I think we can turn it into something. And it usually exactly. comes out stupid. And I, I hear the silence in, at the other end of the telephone and I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, he thinks this is insane. But in, in reality, I'm writing. Yeah. I, I yeah. Usually I've writing. learned to understand that you're doing that. But at first I was like, oh fuck, the silence is telling me he thinks this is stupid. <laughs> but the spin off of that, it's almost always, always turns into something genius. A hundred percent. And and that's the thing. Know that brainstorming is uh, brainstorming itself is general ideas. It's not polished piece of media. It's just the general ideas. And one of the things I took out of the film industry when I was a writer in, in television, you use those index cards and I got a cork board in my office and you put them up scene per scene for the television show. I brought that back into the marketing world is that now I use those index cards and I, when I'm brainstorming, when you call in, I write it on an index card. I pin into my board and then that's as, old school. Yeah. As time goes by, it's like, you know, sometimes some of those come off because we do create campaigns at them. Sometimes they stay up there for a long time. But the great thing is there's times where you have sent me a text and say, you know, hey, someone just commented on Facebook and said this. And you're like, I was thinking of saying this in return just to, you know, boost some engagement. And I look at the wall and I'm like, oh, fuck, remember that thing that's been sitting there for a year and a half? If you said that now, that works there. It's not an ad. But it actually works. It's some PR shit. Yeah, so the timing of that brainstorming is important as well, too. Oh, exactly. So when I say index cards, you can use sticky notes. You can type them on your computer. I like to be visual. I like to walk by that shit every day. It might spark an idea. I might see that piece of dog shit that's on the wall and twist it and say, oh, my God, I never thought of that. That's gross. Just to clarify, it's not actual dog shit. No. It's a shitty idea on a post-it. shitty idea, yeah. The other other tip I want to give about brainstorming is... and. It's funny because most people, I've had a client actually say to me, it's like, well, I don't have a space because I work out of my house. So maybe I'll rent an office for the day, a boardroom that we can brainstorm in. And I'm like, okay, but it doesn't have to be there. Like it could be at the coffee shop. It could be in a backyard while you're flipping burgers and, uh, you know, you're just pitching ideas. It's, I tell people that all the time. It's like, change your environment. If you work from home, don't have it at your house. Some of the best ideas we've had uh, have been driving. Mm -hmm. For me, because I have the solitude and I'm just thinking. So that's like the by myself creative geniuses have come from me driving and just having that silence. But collectively as a group, it's often outside, like sitting by a campfire, having a cocktail. And it just, I don't know, you just got to put yourself in the environment that is conducive to your you know, creativity. That's the thing. Brainstorming doesn't have to happen nine to five. It doesn't have to be that scheduled meeting and mundane and all that. Just have fun with it. Brainstorming nine to five. <laughs> That's going to go in there. I'm not cutting that out. Fine. Bring it on. Um, but and the last point I just want to make is uh, the best idea. Sometimes you will come up with an idea and it's so great. And you, you tell me the idea and I'll write it down. I pin it to the board and you're like, okay, let's expand on that. You, you heard that, right? I have good ideas. He sometimes. Does. Has some good ideas, some bad ideas. And you I just said there's no such thing as a bad idea. Fuck, make up your mind. <laughs> I'm just quoting Pinky in the Brain. Jesus. So hard on me. I know. So the thing is, is that taking those good ideas, the, the, if you see that you have a great idea, you need to, to process it. So yes, you could sit there and if you're brainstorming, you're trying to come up with like five ads, you want to do five ads and you're trying to think of them all. 
if you get stuck on that one good idea, you will not brainstorm the rest. So I always say elaborate on the best ideas at the end of the session. And and another thing too that I found has been conducive to creativity is actually using other people's ideas. 100%. Like I want to use the eggs commercial, for example. Yeah, yeah. How many times did we refer to that while brainstorming and just having tons of laughs and all uh-huh. of a sudden... You're just like the realm of possibilities open up because you're like, I don't have to have these ideas in this little box. And it really takes you to the exactly think outside the box. It's like yeah. eggs for lunch. That's not weird. That's weird. It's not weird. You're weird for thinking it's weird. <laughs> you know, and then we just like, I love that series of egg commercials. And yeah. it's just, it's created so much thought process of just fucking thinking out there of the stupidity that we can put together that turns into something genius. I love it. I just love it. I love marketing. And you know what? I love brainstorming. (laughs) I love working with you. And I actually love fucking talking about this with my friends, my family, my clients, because it always turns into some really cool stuff. For sure. And you know what? You're not the only client who does that to me. When I first started in the game here, it was one of those things where I'm like, how do I deal with this? Because people will come to us and say, Oh my God, the egg commercial. Have you seen the, it's, it's, you're weird for thinking it's weird. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like I, I want to make that commercial. And I'm like, okay, well you, you can't make that commercial because it's already made. We can't steal it. And it took me many years to figure out, okay, I understand now that I need to look at that commercial and say, what is it about that commercial that's triggering those things for yeah, you? That gets you exciting for sure. And then once I was able to figure that out, we have some clients who we go to them, we're like, what are you thinking about marketing? They're like, we have no idea. And I'm like, well, what's your favorite commercial? What commercial on TV? And they're like, well, there's nobody in my market on TV. And I'm like, no, no, no. It could be anything. Well, can I tell you my second favorite? Because the egg oh, one is yeah, my yeah. favorite. Tell me. It's the old Kmart commercials of ship my pants. Yeah. I just ship my pants. Oh my God. They were advertising for anyone who hasn't seen those YouTube that shit. That is, they are funny. It's Kmart is promoting that they're doing free shipping. Yeah. I just ship my pants. I shipped my pants twice yesterday. I shipped my drawers. <laughs> so stupid, but so genius. Yeah. I just shipped my bed. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, they're genius. So this is just kind of like a lighthearted conversation about brainstorming and marketing because we could get so much deeper and we don't have time for that. You see how easy it was for us to go through that second piece, though. I mean, it just comes so naturally when you open yourself up to that brainstorming and that creativity. It's just, oh my God, I find it so energizing. I, I want to, uh, we're going to take a quick break and then... Uh, then we're going to brainstorm, right? We're going to brainstorm about our kids. Uh, okay. If I was really Matthew McConaughey, I would tell you in the smoothest voice that when it comes to your future, it pays to use a certified financial planner. Live well today while planning to live well tomorrow with St. Cyr and Associates. Hashtag call Renee. All right, all right, all right. So listen, I want to talk about kids. Um, I'm a little further behind you. You know, mine are, the, they're preteen and a teenager now. And it's, uh, you know, I'm starting to feel that, that the, those moments of disconnect. Just the beginning, my friend. So I have some tips for it. Uh, you know, whether they work for you or not, I'm definitely not a psychologist. I have no tips. No. I just have life experience. Exactly. No and that's, tips. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, mine aren't Still really tips. It's just more of, yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's more of what I do, right? And like one of the things I do, and it's it, it might seem silly, and I'm sure my kids fucking hate it, especially my older one, is that I aim for at least three hugs a day, which sounds reasonable. But as teenagers grow, they less likely to want to hug you. And we try to keep that tradition is that every morning I give my kids a hug since they were babies. It's like, hey, good morning. How are you? And See, I have teens. As much as I'd like three hugs a day, I'm lucky to get three hugs a year. I know. And that's the thing. It's like I tried to do it consistently. So now as they're getting older, you could tell they're starting to be like, oh, yeah, okay, thanks. This is so, weird, Dad. Yeah. This but, is like eggs for lunch. This is weird. Exactly. So... And the other thing I try to do just to kind of keep the the communication open is that I've, and I kind of learned this on my own. I used to be a, what I call a barker. So I'll yell upstairs like, hey, can you clean your room? That's fucking total shutdown. That, that means the room is not getting cleaned. It means I'm going to have to ask again. It means that they're going to be mad at me because I asked them to clean their room. And what I've been doing now is it's a more playful thing, right? So like I'll use nicknames. I might use, I'll do a Kermit the Frog voice. And it's something, you know, like I have nicknames. Like I'll, I'll yell up, hey, boo-boo chicken, do me a favor, tidy up your room. 
And it's always one of those things. They're even though they're teenagers, like, oh my god, he just called me boo boo chicken. What a dummy. My dad's an idiot. Yeah, but then they clean the room. And it's like it's just that playful mentality, right? And so I, I kind of learned that because when I would just go up and try to bark orders, it, it goes back to that old theory that everyone has is like, I'm not gonna raise my kids how my parents raised me, because there are things I didn't like and I'm gonna do better. But then we all find ourselves guilty of it. And it's like, fuck. I'm my parents. So another thing is um, disconnect and not disconnecting from your kids, disconnecting from technology. With my family, we have this thing that we do every Sunday. We watch America's Funniest Home Videos. Yeah, you've told me that before. Yeah, and I've been doing it since I was a kid and all the way up until now. Like I never miss an episode. That's cool. And there was a moment where my kids were sitting there, we're watching funny videos. My phone buzzes. I look at it. I get a text. I send it. And then I had this kind of out of body experience where I literally pulled myself and I stepped back and I looked at my entire family and I was on my phone. My wife was on her phone. My son was on his phone and my daughter sitting on an iPad playing a game. And I thought, what in the fuck is going on? We're literally sitting there together as a family. We're not talking to each other. We just got our faces buried. Yeah, that's messed. Like I've never seen my daughters like in their young adult years watch television without having their phone in their hand. And it's, like, it's that's mind-boggling like, to like me. Like the multitasking is can't be good for, it can't be good. No. So what, what I did was I, I kind of took that and I was like, hell no. So what I did was I stole everybody's chargers. That was my first step. And I said, we put them in the dining room. That's the most boring room in our house. And I told everyone, I said, when we have family time, that's when you're going to charge your phones. Oh, okay. That's a good idea. So it kind of forces that that family time, which at first was difficult because we were so connected to our phones that when we actually sat together and tried to talk, it was almost a little like you were talking to a stranger. Yeah, and you get that you get that separation anxiety from your device as well too, right? Oh, exactly. And the thing is, is uh, well, one of the last things we do is you know we show up. We're we're there one hundred percent. So when someone's talking, I make sure my phone goes down. I make sure I don't have anything in my hands. There's nothing to distract me. If they want to tell me something, I should listen. And so we do this thing at bedtime where we put our kids to bed. And instead of just walking in the room saying, night, love you, see you in the morning. I go in and it's a good five to 10 minutes of, I I set aside that time where I go in and I'm like, I'll ask about their day again. Even though I know about their day, it might be something they told me. I'll say, you know, I remember you tell me about math class or recess or your hockey game. It gives them that moment where they're like, oh, dad was listening to me. Yeah, real connection. So that's it. I don't know. I'm going to go. I'm gonna, it's, a, it's not bedtime yet, but I feel like I need to go snuggle chat with my kids. You had lots to say there. I did. You must you know, be exhausted. I am. You know, I have, I have passion for my kids. I love my kids and you're the same. You would do anything for your children. And yeah, of course I would, uh, I'd take a bullet for my kids. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting, the difference in dynamics, right? Because uh, mine are at the tail end of their teens and you know, they're busy with work, they're busy yeah. with their academics and their friends, but it's kind of, it's kind of nice to see the a relationship evolve with their maturity and with where they are in life and their interests, you know, yeah. as young adults. So it's really cool to, to connect with them at a different level, more at an adult level. So you've got some, you've got some rough patches to, to go still. They, oh, they say, they say boys are better. Yeah. Uh, and my girls were really good, but you just get to that age where they're just sort of busy doing their own thing. Yeah, right? yeah. And it's hard. It is. It's very hard to connect. When, when my daughter stopped cuddling with me on the sofa, like for us, we would cuddle on the sofa after breakfast and just have like a, like a half hour of us time, Yeah, regardless of what the cartoon was, or if they were watching a movie or something, yeah. we would just have like a half hour of cuddle time before they went off to school. And it was just like, oh man, I'm the luckiest guy alive. And then when they stopped doing that, just because they were growing up and it wasn't cool to hang out with dad like yeah. that, I was, oh, I was fucking heartbroken. Yeah, I don't doubt that at all. Uh, speaking of heartbroken, this is the end of the episode. So, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I did pour my emotions out today. Uh, got a little mushy, and uh, yeah, that's 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 this side of Daryl that you haven't seen yet. So welcome to the mushy side. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We'll see you next time. See you soon, guys. Bye.